So my talk will be dynamic or transient superconducting responses uh, seen in photo excited studies that is just uh, introduced and also Nernst effect. And uh, I wish to discuss the role of competing order. Uh, so my thinking about these kind of things started when Andrea Cavallari visited Columbia University three years ago, March of 2017, I was sitting in his talk and then all the ideas that I will tell you today uh, occurred to me. Uh, I wish also to thank the uh, helps of uh, both Andrea and Daniel Nicoretti uh, in making uh, graphs and so on. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, we, used to, we often call unconventional superconductors. Uh, I think there are known BCS-like condensation aspects in four different, probably, things. The first three, TC scales with superfluid density. This is what uh, we have been doing since 1989. Second is the pseudo gap behavior at T star, first found by NMR and transport measurement in 1989, and then later by ARPES experiment as well. And the third evidence or third signature is vertex like Nernst effect and diamagnetic susceptibility pioneered by Huang Ong at Princeton from 2000. And the fourth signature is the transient superconducting responses after photo excitation, uh, which appears to show very apparently high transient TC. Uh, this is pioneered by Andrea Cavalleri, and we also saw the presentation of Shimano Sensei today. Um, so today I'd like to propose a phenomenology or a picture based on equilibrium and transient superfluid density so that we can unify or we can try to explain all these four phenomena in uh, at least one picture. So let me start with the superfluid density. Uh, I'm showing here that this uh, graph of transition temperature, Tc, versus the uh, minimum spin relaxation rate in the horizontal axis, which at t equals zero, uh, which represents this uh, superconducting carrier density Ns divided by the effective mass m star, which we usually call superfluid density. And as you are seeing here in the underdoped cuprate, we are seeing very interesting linear relationship. Uh, we started to see this from 1989. And uh, now not only in cuprates, but also if you do the experiment on carbon-60 systems or ion acinide systems, we have approximately the same uh, ratio between TC and the superfluid density. So we now, we started to com convert this horizontal axis into the energy scale of superconducting carriers because you see NS over M star is very closely related to the Fermi energy. And uh, that is the plot we made in 1991 and ever since afterwards. Uh, in this horizontal axis, we converted the superfluid density explicitly into two-dimensional Fermi energy or with combination of some other parameter, the three-dimensional Fermi energy. This is essentially the charge energy scale but superconducting charge energy scale in the horizontal axis and Tc in the vertical axis. You are seeing that uh, um, the linear relationship I showed in the previous graph is coming out in this linear relationship. And uh, we are seeing that in, not only in cuprets, but also in uh, carbon-60 and BEDT and many other <laughs> unconventional superconductors, the ratio of TC versus this effective Fermi energy is very high, which is much higher than conventional BCS simple metal superconductors lying here. And uh, this is, in my opinion, a very important signature that uh, showing these new superconductors are not doing BCS-like condensation. In BCS superconductors, you're, for example, you have this Fermi surface, but if you create a gap, you can make it superconducting, and TC scales with the gap or electron phonon coupling constant, but the superfluid density is this uh, Fermi sphere charge numbers. And uh, you can think about a system with even half energy gap, TC becomes half, but the superfluid density is the same as long as any small gap is protecting 
is Fermi's fair. So in BCS condensation or BCS superconductor, the Zeros approximation is that TC is not scaling with this Fermi energy or super free density. In fact, you can see this uh, tin aluminum and zinc, which have approximately the same Fermi temperature or Fermi energy, but they have very different TC. So this is example of TC not scaring with uh, the charge, uh, the, the carrier density things. But in contrast, as you can see here, all these, most of these unconventional new superconductors, TC is very much directly related to the number of carriers that you are seeing here. And so this is the first, one of the first signatures that these new superconductors are very different, fundamentally different from BCS condensation. Okay, the next thing you can do is to, to assume, we, we just derived the number of carriers in the mass. So assume that, but these are fermion numbers. So all these fermions at very high temperature hypothetically make a very strong coupling and uh, just a boson. And then what would happen for those bosons? So, <clears throat> so the bosons would be very independent with each other at very high temperature. The thermal wavelength is much shorter than the interparticle distance, as you can see here. But once you cool down at some temperature, the thermal wavelength or the spread of the wave function becomes comparable to the interparticle, interboson distance. And there, theoretically or hypothetically, we would expect both condensation to happen. And uh, that is this hypothetical Bose condensation line that I show with this dotted line. Okay. So, but in the layer of superconductors that we are seeing, the uh, condensation temperature that layer TC is lower by factor of four or five from this hypothetical Bose Einstein condensation temperature. This is, in my opinion, due mostly to the existence of competing magnetic order but uh, also the low dimensionality can lower the TC. And so TC becomes always lower than this uh, hypothetical Bose condensation line. So up to here, this Bose condensation line is simply a hypothetical or theoretical thinking uh, line. But today I will show you that there are two at least observations that would put points on this dotted red line, hypothetical Bose condensation line. So the first one of that is this Nernst effect onset temperature. I'm showing you the original results of Nernst effect in the 214 system and diamagnetic susceptibility also in the 214 system. And uh, so their onset temperature is very high, much higher than actual TC. And in fact, it's about factor of four higher in the underdoped side. But also, please understand that this onset temperature is significantly or much lower than T star. This is the, uh, this um, NMR T star, night shift T star. So anyway, so we have this onset temperature and we can try to plot this onset temperature of the Nernst effect in the previous uh, diagram of TC versus TF. And this point, for example, gives uh, 214 systems point here, which is shown in this circle. And uh, so it's very close to this hypothetical BEC dotted line, where we assume that local phase coherence is at least achieved. And uh, uh, we can have the similar point from YBCO, underdoped YBCO Nernst effect here. And uh, as uh, we saw, this BEDT organic system also, Nernst effect was measured. And the most underdoped sample of that, the Nernst effect starts around 50 Kelvin, which is here. And uh, that is again, if you plot with the same superfluid density, it uh, measured already by mu SR on the same material, then it will give a point on this hypothetical dotted BCS line, a uh, BEC line. And uh, also, interestingly, uranium uranium to silicon to the onset of Nernst effect is here. This is actually the starting of hidden order. 
and some so hidden order actually gives this onset nuance effect, and that is also happening in this uh, uh, hypothetical both condensation line. Okay, now the second experimental observation comes from Cavallari's experiment, as you have already seen uh, in the previous talk. I will show you this uh, potassium 3C60 experiment. They could measure they measure from from measuring optical conductivity. One can estimate the super free density from this missing drew the spectral weight. If you excite the system by uh, high frequency uh, light, then uh, this missing drew the feature continues to high temperature, and uh, so this uh, transient result would allow us to estimate a transient super free density and transient TC. So doing that for the point of potassium 3C60, we obtain the point here. And uh, also for underdoped YBCO, we obtain another point from here. These are from the results of Cavareri's group. So we are seeing that uh, uh, in both this transient response by the right excited experiment, and Nernst effect, we have a point, actually observed point on this dotted line. So let us see this, where how things are in the air uh, phase diagram. So let's start with RSCO. So this is phase diagram of RSCO. This T star is uh, from NMR and uh, uh, normal state conductivity. The Nernst effect is shown here. Okay, this is a Nernst effect, onset temperature, and diamagnetism onset temperature. This is ERTC, and uh, we measured super free density by mu SR, and then we can convert that super free density into this hypothetical Bose-Einstein condensation temperature, and that is shown by this pink star. At very lower <laughs> underdoped region, you can see this pink star line, and the line, the onset of Nernst effect and diamagnetism is overlapping. So this is a very, I think, very important signature that uh, this Nernst effect has something to do with this uh, hypothetical Bose condensation. So if you look at the more conceptual way, so in my opinion, T star is representing under which the uh, and the fermions become converted into bosons slowly. So this is kind of pair formation temperature. And uh, in the underdop side, at lower temperatures, mostly the normal state is having bosons. And uh, then if you cool down, as I showed you, the bosons would have uh, the inter-particle distance comparable to its thermal wavelengths at some temperature. And so you would expect Bose-Einstein condensation to hypothetically happen in this, at this temperature if there's no, no other disturbing uh, feature. So let us call this as local phase coherence temperature. And uh, it is actually overlapping very well with this uh, Nernst effect onset temperature. Uh, if you go to more closer to the optimal redope side, this local phase coherence line is bent because in my opinion, this is just determined by the number of preformed bosons. And uh, you see this T size boson formation. So boson is less formed here as compared to the underdoped side. And uh, therefore uh, the boson number is getting lower and uh, this curvature is getting lower in the nearly, nearing the optimal redoped side. Okay, so the situation of YBCO is similar. Uh, here we show this uh, uh, T star line, and there has been a controversy between the group of Typhair and Ong on Nernst effect onset temperature. But Typhair is plotting Nernst onset temperature, including the effect from KSI particle or fermions, and therefore his onset is nearly close to T star. However, if you choose the uh, uh, vertex Nernst effect, the point comes here 
and uh, also the diamagnetism points are here. And also there is this uh, precursor uh, onset or superconductivity temperature that was uh, determined from optical conductivity by uh, Christian Bernhardt group and also by Tajima's group. We have heard about that in the previous talk and that comes here. Okay. So this is again the Nernst onset kind of temperature and that is again agreeing reasonably well with this uh, uh, hypothetical Bose-Einstein condensation temperature, this uh, pink line. Now, uh, in this material, we can compare the transient uh, superfluid density measured by the Cavalieri group. And uh, they plotted here the transient uh, and onset temperature in this transient superfluid density. And this is actually the uh, equilibrium superfluid density at the lowest temperature. Now for this YBCO 6.6, .6, the onset temperature comes here, which is somehow close to this uh, announced effect onset. 6.5, the onset temperature comes here. And uh, this is somehow different from this uh, announced onset line, but still close to this uh, YBCO, the uh, Bose-Einstein condensation line. So I showed this point in the previous TC versus TF plot. Okay. And uh, if you go to much more underdoped side, 6.45, uh, the uh, onset temperature is very high. But we notice that uh, the apparent transient superfluid density is much higher than the equilibrium value. So this means that uh, the light is doing something, other, something more. And I will come back to this point in the end of my talk. But anyway, otherwise, this feature is very similar to, YB, uh, to LSCO. So BEDT system, we saw in the uh, talk of uh, Daniel Nicoretti. Uh, so that system has anti ferromagnetic parent compound here, and then superconductivity appears. You can tune these boundaries by pressure or chemical substitution. Uh, so we performed MUSR experiments in this organic conductors and the from which we can measure the superfluid density and then we can de so derive this uh, hypothetical Bose condensation temperature or local phase coherence temperature and that's here. As compared to that, the narrowest effect measured by the British group would give points here, here, here and here. So the very underdoped region, the narrow onset temperature is comparable to this uh, both con hypothetical both condensation temperature. And then it, the narrow effect dies away very quickly. We have seen in the previous talks that most recent results from the Cavalry group would put point on the onset of this photo excited effect. And it's here. Okay, so this is again very close to this announced onset temperature. And uh, also they said the unpublished result that if you come to this material, then this effect dies away. Very similar to the case of this uh, uh, announced effect. So in this plot, I have point A is here, B, C, D is here. So not all the points of nearest onset comes to onto this dotted line. It's only those underdoped regions that would come to this dotted line. This photo excitation experiment we have seen that its onset temperature is 50 Kelvin. And if we assume that the equilibrium and photo excited superfluid density at the lowest temperature is comparable and most likely so, then we have this point from photo induced effect here. So again, putting a point on this dotted line. Okay, carbon 60. So this is a phase diagram of carbon 60. Again, it has this anti ferromagnetic parent compound and then superconductivity in the sort of seemingly overdoped like situation. DC goes down with pressurizing. Um, we did mu SR in the equilibrium sample of these three systems from which we derive this uh, Bose condensation temperature, hypothetical temperature energy scale. Now, the uh, Nicoretti and uh, Cavalieri did experiment by laser 
excitation. These are the super free density they measured transgenetry. And uh, at low temperature, it is somehow larger than the, the equilibrium super free density. So that means the transient energy scale of this both condensation like uh, temperature would be here. Now, uh, compared to this, the actual onset temperature of this transient superconducting Dirac response is something like slightly lower than 200 Kelvin, as you see here, because 200 Kelvin is almost completely eliminating the gap. So let's point it here. And uh, again, they are comparable. Also, they did experiment by applying pressure and find out on carbon uh, potassium 3C60 and find out that this uh, photo induced effect dies away very quickly if you approach to more or less over the side. This is exactly the same behavior we have seen in BEDT, both for Nernst effect and optical conductivity photo excited effect. Okay, so that experiment brings a point here. So up to here is the experiment. Now let's consider why TC is reduced in these actual systems from this hypothetical Bose condensation line. Okay, so to think about that, in my opinion, it's useful to first compare with superfluid helium, where the Bose condensation temperature by <laughs> just the number of density and mass of the helium is 3.2 Kelvin, but actual lambda point is 2.2 Kelvin. Also, if you compare this cube rates, the BEC temperature is about a factor of five higher than the actual TC. Okay, so in my opinion, another important factor is the closeness to the magnetic order. The simple way to understand that is to remember the 214 phase, uh, the cube rates. And the 214 system and 123 system if you compare with the same superfluid density, the 214 system has lower TC in this region. And most likely you agree that the 214 system is closer to magnetic order, and that's why we are seeing lower TC. So there's a competition matter in here. In fact, the LBCO, the magnetism is completely winning, and the superconductivity is suppressed. So how close you are to magnetism is a very important factor for determining TC. And uh, more quantitatively, I think it is useful to make, uh, <laughs> think about the energy of this magnetic resonance mode. Magnetic resonance mode is an inelastic excitation you see in almost all these unconventional superconductors. And as a fact, TC scales with the mode energy very nicely. And secondary, we can compare the case with the case of superfluid helium. And uh, superfluid helium, there is some similar excitation, roton excitation. And uh, in different pressure, the superfluid helium roton energy and lambda point temperature is scaling on the same scale with that of this magnetic resonance mode. In my opinion, <laughs> anyway, so these excitations are appearing in the wave vector or periodicity of the parent antiferromagnetic compound or pairing hexagonal closed pack solid helium. So this is related to the competing state, but this inelastic excitation is appearing as a sh short time dynamic and short range fluctuation of imminent magnetic or, or, or solid order of the competing state. And in my opinion, most likely this <laughs> the free energy can be written in this kind of double wear situation and this resonance mode, this energy is related to the difference between the energy minimum of this uh, superconducting and superfluid state as compared to the antiferromagnetic or, or storied order. And this obviously controls how stable the superconductivity and so TC value of this uh, superconductor or superfluid. Okay, so this feature can be also seen in the phase diagram. These are the phase diagrams of the uh, unconventional superconductors. You see again, you see a <laughs> parent <coughs> magnetic compound in carbon 60. And the superfluid helium has hexagonal closed back solid 
uh, parent and competing state. And, uh, but the boundary of all these phase diagrams is first order transition. And that is very consistent, in my opinion, with this kind of picture, that these two different ground states are competing and giving this first order transition. Okay, so just last, my statement of magnetic resonance mode is the following. In the BEC BCS crossover like picture, so in the, after the optimal doping region, in the optimal overdoped region, in fact, final state is E. And so the major thermal excitation is pair breaking excitation. And this is actually consistent with the explanation of the magnetic resonance mode by many people for D-wave superconductors. But if you consider the underdoped region, the normal state is mostly 2E. And uh, if you had to break it, the pairs into different, into the, the two fermions, you have to excite up to this energy scale. But there's some, so there should be some thermal excitation which determines Tc. And so, in my opinion, magnetic resonance mode is a very good candidate for determining Tc as thermal excitation. But you can see that this excitation is pair non-breaking and collective mode. So in this sense, magnetic resonance mode has a dual character. You know, it's a mixture essentially in experimentally of this kind of pair breaking and pair non-breaking excitation. And uh, which one is winning depends just on which part of the phase diagram you are. Now, so let us think about why the photo excitation changes TC. Okay, so this is a Cavalieri's result of time dependence after the, you know, after the <laughs> laser excitation. And uh, this is optical conductivity. What is mainly changing is here, this uh, uh, 400 Kaiser mode intensity. And that intensity at low temperature is depleted or reduced by the laser excitation and it's converted into a lower energy region. A very similar thing happens, interestingly, if in the equilibrium system, but just you raise the temperature, at low temperature you have certainly this uh, 400 Kaiser mode, but uh, it is reduced or eliminated at high temperature and the spectral weight is shifted to lower energy. Now, this 400 Kaiser mode, interestingly, is at least as Tim's reported in YBCO 6.6, following the same intensity temperature dependence as that of the neutron magnetic resonance mode. So this might be, this mode might be mimicking the magnetic resonance mode. So if we adopt this view, then what, is, what we are seeing is that uh, laser would suppress 400 Kaiser mode, and that is equivalent of laser light somehow suppressing magnetic resonance mode, and it is equivalent of laser light removing effectively the competing magnetic interaction, and that would promote transient TC. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> So that is my explanation why the, the TC is raised. Essentially, it is because the laser is doing bad thing for magnetic order and uh, eliminating this resonance mode. Now, this is consistent, at least qualitatively, with the behavior of air 214 system. In the 214 system, the, uh, this is a Josephson uh, signal in superconducting LSCO, but in non-superconducting LSCO stripe ordered system, there's not, no such thing because it's magnetically ordered and non-superconducting, but light excitation, Cavalieri could induce superconductivity signal by shining light. So this means that shining light is promoting superconductivity and uh, it's actually hearing magnetic order, and that is shown by this experiment of LBCO. The light promotes superconductivity magnetic, uh, superconductivity response, but it killed the uh, charge and spin stripe response. So 
in RBCO and RESCO, we saw melting of charge stripe for magnetic odor, and that is certainly helping induce transient superconductivity. In YBCO, we saw melting of not black point, but inelastic resonance mode. And that is sufficient to help or to suppress magnetic order, competing order, and help superconductivity and raise TC. Okay, so in YBCO, what we saw is that there is this uh, signal from C axis conductivity signal in the Josephson plasma signal, and this is showing the photo induced effect. As Daniel Nicoletti told, very recently, the Cavalry group did the second harmonic intensity measurement in uh, underdoped YBCO. And uh, without excitation, the second harmonic died away just at TC, the real TC. But with right excitation, they could induce the second harmonic effect up to very high temperature. And then this onset temperature of the second harmonic this is somehow related to this uh, Josephson plasma oscillation that seemingly follows T star line. And uh, uh, but this is somehow understandable if you remember that T star in the charge conductivity first reported by Uchida and uh, also T star is also in AV plane. But C axis T star can be understood that once the pair is formed, then it becomes difficult to conduct in, uh, in the C-axis direction, and so the C-axis conductivity becomes this uh, insulating. So certainly the C-axis plasma may be related to this pair formation. However, I was mainly today talking about the sort of relationship of this optical experiment with this, not with T star, but with the uh, uh, phase coherent onset temperature or you know, local phase coherence temperature. And that scenario works for this and this material, but not for very underdoped YBCO. For example, this one, there's no superfluid density in the equilibrium, but uh, this induced photo effect is starting at very high temperature. So Cabarelli group has, I think, a view still that uh, this onset is tracking this T star. However, I would like to point out that uh, this uh, light seems to be changing also either effective mass and or charge carrier density. That's why you have induced this superfluid density as compared. So the system itself is changed in this case, seemingly by the light, not only the balance between magnetism and superconductivity, but system itself seems to be changed. Okay, so this is my last graph, view graph. At high temperature, we have unpaired fermions. And then, uh, first point to happen is pair formation. This is a two body problem, and you just need attractive interaction among fermions. Then, at some point, if you cool down the, uh, the interparticle distance becomes comparable to thermal wavelengths of the bosons or preformed pairs. And uh, you reach to this interesting local phase coherence point. And uh, as I showed you, we have two different observations, but also we learned today that uh, Shimano senses fat T2 and uh, uh, also optical conductivity is sort of precursor point, all following this point. And actually, uh, Bianconi's uh, this, this uh, structure or something is also maybe appearing at this point, but this is not enough to make real ground state superconductivity. The superconductivity TC is much lower because it has to win against competing order. There may be also something related to order parameter fluctuation or maybe parallel conductivity. And uh, the other you know, signal from this uh, Shimano senses talk today may be reflecting this one, which is very close, like 10% above TC, we always see this. And this is somehow sort of time dependent on the probe time. So uh, photo excitation can suppress competing order, and that makes this TC closer to this local phase coherence temperature. 
And but photo excitation may also be doing change of carrier density and or effective mass in this fluke mechanism or whatever. And so we have to be somehow careful. But in my opinion, we can understand most of these experiment and evolution by essentially this Bose-Einstein to be this crossover picture with the existence of competing order. So I published this thing in Physical Review Materials. So if you have a chance, please read that for more details. Thank you very much.